Uh, the first of which is going to be from Julia Serro from the University of Bath, which is entitled Deep Diving into Single Cell Data. Green. So, Julia, whenever you're ready. You... Great. So I, I changed my title a little bit because I largely because I forgot what I had told you. Um, so <laughs> uh, thanks, everybody, for. Yeah, thanks for having me, Nigel. And I'm just going to talk about my experiences um, in re doing research in the time of COVID and doing high content image analysis from the safety and comfort of one's own bedroom. So I've been at Bath as a lecturer in biology and biochemistry for just about two years now. And I am a cell biologist by training. Um, uh, then I, in my postdoc, I became a systems biologist, uh, sort of accidentally. And the way that this happened was that I was using high content automated image analysis to investigate cell signaling and cell behavior. And so this was using, um, high content, uh, confocal microscopes. I've also used high content wide field microscopes. And basically we take, uh, high multi-well plates, so my personal favorites are 384 well plates. Um, and then we can plate different cell lines, cells with different chemical treatments, use siRNA or in these these days uh, CRISPR to do genetic perturbations and then stain the cells and label them for all sorts of things. So we can label the DNA, uh, we can label elements of the cytoskeleton. I was particularly interested and I'm still working working on um, looking at the regulation of mechanosensitive transcription regulators like the YAP and TAS family proteins. Uh, so we can use um, high content imaging to take hundreds and hundreds, thousands, even more than thousands, tens of thousands uh, of images of cells. And then in each of those images, we can have anywhere from a few dozen to a few hundred cells. So we end up with absolutely massive um, big data problems and big data problems need some interesting statistical solutions quite often to um, identify hits in a screen or to look at uh, statistical relationships in highly heterogeneous and and um, high dimensional data so i've teamed up with uh, various people over the years computer scientists statisticians and most recently at bath um, the institute of mathematical innovation in the maths department to come up with strategies for uh, actually dealing with this this very high level very heterogeneous data so just a little bit about automated image analysis if you're not familiar with um, this this type of concepts um, so we use automated cell detection and and um, we can use various different strategies for this so there are various um, software which perform this automated cell segmentation and so typically with cells what we do is we identify uh, nuclei and then use that as a, a kernel, uh, as it were, to identify then uh, cell cytoplasms. But there are various ways. There are as many ways of doing this as there are things that you can stain in a cell. And once you have good segmentation, then you can do anything. You can measure anything that you want. So you can look at subcellular intensities. You can look at cell geometries. You can look at behavioral and structural features like um, actin-based protrusions and the extent of cell-cell contact. So we get lots of different descriptors for every cell. Um, so automated cell segmentation, yeah, it's doing a lot of basically similar things under the hood. So one that I've been using uh, since I've been at Bath is Cell Profiler, which is a free open source and is compatible with most different file types. So with this, we can identify and segment nuclei, we can segment cells. Uh, segment is just a way of saying identify. Uh, we can also identify different components of the cell, like the area just right around the nucleus or the membrane region. Uh, we can look at how uh, cells are packed. So we can look at the, the Voronoi tessellation, Voronoi segmentation to see how, how many neighbor cells have. And we can look at things like how many neighbors are they touching. Um, yeah, so once we've got good segmentation, we can do anything we want, but this takes a lot of work to optimize in the beginning. And then once we, um, once we actually get the data out, we've got a lot of usable data, usually more data than we know what to do with. So what can we do with it? Um, so micrographs are really information rich. And one thing that we can do is of course, just to count nuclei. And um, we can do this very quickly and easily um, uh, using automated processes. But we can also get a lot more for our money out of it. So one thing that we can do is look at uh, where cells are in the cell cycle. 
And we can do that looking at the integrated DNA intensity if we've got a DNA stain. So people have probably seen uh, fax profiles of DNA content. If we look at um, image-based profiles of DNA content, we see similar things. So we can see a peak in G1, we can see a peak in G of cells in G2 with uh, two times the DNA, and we can see this sort of plateau of cells which are in S phase. Uh, but unlike a fax plot, we have so much more information about every cell because we can now we can um, identify stages of the cell cycle, but we can also look at other things that may or may not be related. Um, so I just want to give a little example of, of what we can do and how we look at this with images. So um, this is looking at a uh, micrograph of cells stained with uh, Herxt, or sorry, with DAPI to label the DNA. And each of these little points uh, corresponds to one cell in this image. And we're plotting the integrated DNA, so the sum of all pixel intensities. And we're plotting that as a function of the average uh, pixel intensity. So you can see that some things jump out. So here is our G1 peak, uh, cells which have um, one uh, copy of the genome. And here we have uh, just about uh, two times the integrated intensity cells which are in G2, and then a bunch of cells which are in the middle in S phase. So we can also look at these plots and we can identify cells which have been missegmented. Uh, here are two cells that got stuck together and look like they have uh, four times as much DNA. And here is one cell that got accidentally split in two. So these kinds of plots are really useful also for quality control. But we can even look at more things. So we can find mitotic cells. Uh, we can identify these, these small bright objects and we can even determine whether they are cells um, which have gone through uh, anaphase or cells which are still in metaphase. And then of course we can add more things. So we can add um, more labels. So here we've added um, cyclin A. So cyclin A is a uh, cyclin that is uh, accumulates from the start of S phase. So adding this label in, we've now got a sort of belt and braces approach. So we can identify and we can really rule out um, cells which are polyploid from cells which are actually in G2 and have replicated their DNA. And these correspond to some cells which are polyploid, but not actually cycling. Okay, so then we can use all sorts of combinations of these things to build cell cycle profiles. And now we have a lot of information, not only about um, where the cell is in, uh, in terms of DNA replication, but also where it is in terms of uh, mitosis. Is it in early or late S phase using another marker uh, called PCNA, which gives us different textures in the nucleus depending on where cells are. And finally, we can do some more, uh, even more sophisticated things these days with open source um, and commercial cell cycle, or, or sorry, machine learning tools. And so this is just an example of a user annotated image where we, uh, where we annotated cells based on these stainings um, uh, by the user and then used uh, a machine learning that was running under the hood um, using uh, a web browser interface called Celery. And also we've done this using an open source software called Elastic. And we saw very good agreement between um, classifications made by uh, expert user, which is me, <laughs> and those made by the machine learning. And also I had a student do this training as well. And we came up with very similar results. So a very expert user and a very novice user were able to use this technology um, pretty similarly. So let me just tell you a little bit about what I've been doing um, at Bath. So every year at Bath, we have undergraduate students who do final year projects working uh, with faculty in the department. So pre-COVID, I had students actually in the lab and they were plating cells and they were doing treatments, doing siRNA. And I had them using Cell Profiler to analyze their microscopy data um, using uh, you know, Im images that they had gathered themselves. So post-COVID, obviously, we have had serious restrictions on students getting into the lab. So post-COVID, we've been doing this all at home. But generating data sets is the easy part for me. Um, you can generate data sets in a few days, and you can spend several years really getting to the, to the, the point of, of having analyzed them to death in the proper way. So I've actually got terabytes worth of data some of which has been analyzed, some of which hasn't been. Um, and there are many um, 
image database repositories online for people who maybe don't have their own data, but if wanted to try this uh, themselves, there's a lot of images out there. So the image data repository is one where you can um, download uh, published database uh, data sets uh, from imaging and there are all sorts of things out there. So post COVID, we've really expanded um, not generating new data sets, but the tools that we're using and the tools that the undergraduate students are using to analyze these. So they're using cell profiler, they're using ImageJ, um, they've become proficient in using in writing ImageJ macros, also using um, the elastic machine learning uh, software to do cell classifications and segment hard to segment cells. And I think very importantly, they've also learning to use RStudio to analyze their data. So our final year project students are only in the lab for one semester, which is a really short time. So they're, they're not even there for three months. Um, I, this should actually really say in, in about two months. So in two months, my project students this year have each learned at least three softwares, which are completely new to them. So they would not come in with any sort of coding, any sort of image analysis. Um, and very few of them had even used uh, advanced statistical software. But in two months, they were able to get at least proficient with, with three or more different types of software. And because they weren't actually spending time in the lab, which was unfortunate because that was something that they obviously really wanted to do, they were able to really dive deep into their data. So they were able to generate and test hypotheses using the data sets, and then in some cases, um, further data sets that maybe uh, had another small molecule inhibitor or a, um, a, a siRNA that they had made a prediction about in their previous uh, data set. So in our in my 2020 cohort, they used multi-channel images of fixed cells, which were treated with inhibitors and siRNA, and they performed cell cycle classifications, and they looked at nuclear translocation of uh, specific transcriptional regulators. So they were looking mainly at YAP and TAS. And then now in 2021, my cohort are looking at time series data sets. And these are cells uh, with fluorescent labeled cell cycle markers and transcription factor proteins, such as, as YAP. Um, and they're looking at time series data sets. So here's just an example of the kinds of data that they're looking at. So here's uh, a, the bright field and the uh, cell cycle marker uh, of one of these data sets. So there's some, there's some tricks and some sort of trade craft that they're learning here. So you can see the signal to noise ratio is very poor for these cells. And so we're using the elastic software to um, use machine learning to, to train uh, and make uh, pixel prediction maps. So predicting which pixels are part of nuclei and which are not. And then they're integrating that with cell profiler to make measurements. Um, and we're integrating it with uh, Elastic and with other software like an ImageJ plugins to do cell tracking as well and cell lineage tracing. So I've also got some master students in bioinformatics and they are taking the image analysis data, um, which has already been segmented and that data has been pulled out. So thousands and even millions of cells with uh, dozens to hundreds of different features, different parameters that have been measured. And some of them are using machine learning approaches to model and predict the localization of our transcription factors in fixed cells. Others are using bioinformatics approaches for hit detection in image-based screens. Um, another student in computer science is looking at actually applying agent-based models to look at cell behavior, and she's particularly interested in virus infection. And they're also looking, they're going to be working with the undergraduate students' uh, data over the summer to analyze the single cell lineage tracking and looking at the YAP dynamics in the time series data. So this is all also part of a, a larger goal of mine, which is high content imaging at Bath. So my goals are to establish high content automated imaging pipelines um, for users in the department and in the whole university, and really to build and strengthen collaborations between biology and pharmacy and pharmacology with maths and computer science, and to form a community of users that can support one another. So I'm trying to really sell this to people that automated image analysis can save time, p-values, uh, your risks if you're not drawing little ROIs and your sanity on the emotional roller coaster that is research. And I think it's also a really good opportunity for our students to learn statistical and data science methods, which 
really fills a gap in the training for at least for the biology and biomedical students who don't necessarily get this. Um, and staff also don't necessarily have these skills, uh, which are really highly transferable. So using our studio um, is, is really helpful. And just knowing these sort of basics of coding is really useful for students as well. Um, I'm also doing some uh, recording of workshops and webinars for these different software and making those available um, to students and staff. So I've set up a, an image analysis working group. And so we're trying to build up a, a repository of knowledge that people can draw from. So just to finish off, like our virtual lab environment, how does this actually working in practice? So we have weekly group meetings via Zoom or Teams, and then I meet individually with students every one to three weeks, depending on what they're doing about their projects. And I think what's something that's really important is that the students actually have their own WhatsApp groups or Teams chats um, that they use to support one another. So they're not always running to me. They're actually getting that uh, group experience, which they might not otherwise get, um, both with each other and with uh, like PhD students in uh, in other labs and in, in my group as well. So we've got OneDrive folders, we've got online repositories, but we have had to do some data drops via rendezvous at the Bath Spa train station or uh, via snail mail for students who are further afield. And I have to say, like, I wasn't sure, but it seems to be working pretty well. So my, my three final year project students, uh, undergrads in 2020, all got firsts. Um, some one got a very high quality first uh, on her report. And, and that one was actually recently accepted into a PhD program in Cambridge. So I'm pretty proud of her. Um, and they actually had a pretty good experience. Their record keeping was excellent because they were using electronic media. All of their pipelines were stored. And I would, this is something I'd, I'd like to expand upon in the future. Um, their image analysis protocols that they optimized, and especially their RStudio pipelines, add value uh, for me and my group. Um, and so I've had them kind of trialing new software and new approaches, which has been terrific. It's something that they have time to do. I don't have time to do. But I've you know got the benefit of, of their uh, pipelines and their workflows. And this has led to some preliminary data for grant applications and data to include in publications. Um, and I'm, I'm conscious of I'm conscious of time, so I'll just um, skip through. I just wanted to give you a flavor of some of the um, figures that the students had made. So, like making beautiful box plots and violin plots. And finally, I just wanted to end on what could be better. So, obviously, data storage and access to computing power is something that being off campus is really difficult. Um, so, I think we could do better on that respect. I think we could do better with getting biomedical science students and staff comfortable using quantitative methods and software. And I would really like to strengthen our user community within Bath, uh, between departments, and also beyond. So, sorry for running over, and thanks very much for listening. Thanks, Julia. That was a great talk. I, I wrote a list of questions down and you then promptly went and answered all of them for me. So, uh, <laughs> I'm just going to ask uh, one question. Will you write a how-to guide for the lecture remotely website? Just a short one page, how to do these kind of projects. That would be absolutely fantastic. Yeah, sure. Brilliant. That would be great. Uh, we've got a question from David. He said, how does this uh, approach work between images? So say where the staining is not equal. Is there a way that you can sort of normalise, I suppose, or...? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is something that's very important in um, in image analysis generally. So we have various ways of doing normalizations and the pre-processing steps are quite important for the image analysis. Um, there's also things which are important on how you set up the image. Um, in my work, we I, I typically will be using um, liquid handlers to uh, try and keep things as, as reproducible as possible. But of course, this doesn't always work. So there's a lot of um, uh, pre-processing steps to do like flat field illumination correction and also quality control steps, um, which the students really learned a lot about and they were able to actually do a lot of the QC themselves by the time that they were, you know, in the final stages of their project, which is, which is really important. Um, yeah, so this was uh, this was uh, final year students, and in my case, all three of them had done a um, a placement year, so they had lab experience uh, previously, which definitely helped. But they only one of them had ever um, used any sort of um, computational image analysis. Um, how do I get them up to speed with tools such as R so quickly? Um, 
So I am a total R novice. I am still in the process of trying to wean myself off of bloody Excel. Um, so I have relied a lot on um, edX courses. So I put them, I put them in an edX. Uh, I, I suggested they do an edX course, which was ImageJ Basics and Fundamentals, which also gave them a bit of coding and scripting. Uh, writing macros. Um, there's uh, there's some really good resources out there for image analysis. So there's the new new bias community, which has a lot of uh, webinars, which are on YouTube. And uh, Cell Profiler and Elastic have pretty good documentation and a lot of webinars as well. Um, and I think for our studio, um, a colleague of mine who actually like taught me how to integrate Cell Profile in our studio, he gave a webinar which we also recorded for posterity on specifically how to do that and um I, i've also recommended like a coursera course in r basics uh that they can do um at home so it's a lot you know there is a lot of sort of training but if they were in the lab you know they would be pipetting and setting up their qpcrs four times until they got the one that didn't have air bubbles and, and really worked so i've tried to sort of tell them that okay this it seems kind of boring, but this is the training period. This is the learning new things. So, yeah. I think that feeds quite nicely into to Jeffrey's question about sort of staff upskilling. He says, is there any point in staff developing these approaches to data for themselves or <laughs> be assigned to somebody? Who's yeah, so I, I understand that there is always, you know, we're all pressed for time. And at some point, it's more efficient to hire somebody that knows how to do the thing than to try and teach myself to do the thing. Um, yeah. Uh, so part of, part of why I want to um, really focus on building a, a community of users that includes not only myself, but also PhD students and postdocs um, across the department and people like in computer science and, and maths who do this type of stuff who can be resources is so that uh, so that there's a, a pool of people who, you know, you can go to and, and get support and get some help from. Um, I'm I'm hoping that other staff reading these reports and kind of having the undergraduates and the and the master students who maybe work with them, um, let that that sort of uh, enthusiasm and those skills kind of bubble up and percolate up from the ground up through the department. <laughs> um, and I think that, yeah, so I think that like training, I, I think that trying to learn something like coding or statistics without a reason, like without without a, a, a goal or without a kind of an impetus is a bit of a fool's errand. I mean, I I never learned statistics when I was an undergrad. I, I did not learn it until I needed it. So I think that actually these kinds of projects where students have a reason to like learn how to do some, write a for loop and have a reason to go, actually, what kind of stats do I need for this weird shape data is the best kind of like way that they could learn this and, and Maybe we need to do more of this kind of um, independent research training. Yeah. yeah, I'd love to know Python. I don't know that I can. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, the boat may have sailed for me on that one. <laughs> There's also a question from uh, one of the engineers that's joining us today. Is say, could you use this for volume analysis for bubbles rather than cells, for example? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that people are, are doing that out there in the world, but there's definitely. Um, yeah, if, if you can see something with your eyes, you can probably make the computer see it. Um, it might be easy and it might be tricky, but yeah, there's there's a lot of people doing this kind of stuff, but it's also it's also still sort of weirdly niche, uh, considering that it's been a field of its own for 20 years. Okay. I think it's entering more and more into the sort of scientific mainstream, but it's still a it's still a bit of a pulling teeth kind of battle getting getting some people to actually trust um quantitative image analysis methods like it really does it really does work but it you know it only works if you kind of set it up right and you know what you're doing <laughs> okay great yeah david echoes your your thoughts he said you only really learned stats and uh, qualitative analysis when he started to do uh, pedagogical research um, yeah it's I so I, I don't know maybe we just need maybe we should just only teach stats with like 
a research question because I, I just feel like the way that stats was taught is really very dull. <laughs> it just doesn't didn't stick in my head until I had a compelling uh, questions that I that I needed statistical answers to. <laughs> maybe, that's, maybe that's me. Brilliant. Thank you, Julia. That was really yeah, cool. sure.